welcome to the Big Money Question Show. I'm Rachel Rickard Strauss, personal finance editor at This Is Money. This week, uh, it's about how to make yourself wealthier. Um, so we have Rob Moore here. He is an entrepreneur. He's also author of Money, No More, Make More, Give More, a public speaker, a property investor, and property educator. Um, so we're going to ask Rob, first of all, how do you get the money that you want uh, how do you get the money that you need to live the life that you want? So I think first off you need to understand how much that is. Uh, and I think a lot of people get confused because they, they underestimate their expenses. Uh, they don't realise that inflation will halve the value of your money every 14 or 15 years. So every 14 or 15 years you need to double the capital and the income. Uh, that you might need. Of course, school fees and irregular expenses and all of these uh, things that seem to hit us from everywhere at the moment, people don't factor in. So, um, you know, you might want to look at what your total overheads are. You might want to double them or triple them um, to factor in all of these disruptions to our bank accounts and our finances. Uh, and then make a plan to increase that um, revenue, whether you're going to uh, progress through your career and get pay rises and you know promotions or whether you're going to start up your own enterprise or whether you're going to go into bitcoin at the moment or whatever it might be so it's about having a specific plan uh, and then um, yeah going for the job or the career or the startup business or the scale up business um, that can make that amount of income and then of course you've got to factor in your tax revenues uh, and, and what they will be. Um, you can't master what you don't measure and I think there are a lot of people that they don't even know what they're worth, they don't know what their total overheads are. Um, I think it's really important to have your own personal net worth statement. Now when I started mine 11 years ago it was negative um, but you know it's you've got to start somewhere, it's better to know what it is even if it's bad uh, and I like to review that every six months and then set a target for the next six months of where I want to be. Okay, so you work out how much you're going to need and then you work out from that how you're going to get there. So how do you decide if, if it's going with your existing career, if it's finding a new one, if it's, you know, going and, and doing some, setting up something yourself? Mm. Well, I think if you're in the career that you're in, you've got to look at can I progress? You know, so you've got to look at who's a level or two or three above you if they are. Um, is someone in your next level of promotion 20 years older than you and they were promised to be on the board or be shareholders and they're not? Or are you in a disruptive business where there are lots of promotions? Uh, and if, if you don't see that you can't get there in your career, then maybe you've got to look at um, you know, a more disruptive or forward-thinking business. You know, like there's a lot of fast-growing technology businesses at the moment. There's a lot of disruptive industries where you, know, you really can progress quickly. It doesn't just have to be Facebook and Google, but there are a lot like it. Um, and then if you feel that you could do it quicker, um, or you could have bigger upside setting up your own business, which I did 11 years ago, uh, then you know, you've got to look at, okay, maybe I need to save a certain amount so I can pay myself for six months to 24 months you know, without earning a lot of money and then go and start your second career. It's easier than ever now to have a second career because you can have an e-commerce business online, you, know, you can just run a business from your phone now. You don't have to actually quit your job. You can do it evenings and weekends. Um, and sort of maybe have a two or three year plan to match your income for your job uh, and then you know, maybe move across. So you work out, say your current income is that and you want it to be that and you need to work out how to bridge that gap. But it seems to me a lot of that must be about coming up with the idea. I mean, you're okay if, if your existing career is going to get you there in time but if you look at it and you just think there's no way I'm, I'm going to get there doing what I do then you need a pretty good idea don't you? Uh, well I think that there are so many ideas out there that you don't really need to come up with it yourself so for example you could research on Google Trends and Facebook Trends you know, and find out, um, if you're a retailer, an online retailer, you find out what's trending to be sold and you sell that. Uh, if you're looking to start your own business, you look at what's trending. Um, you but know. aren't they going to be the areas that are most saturated already? Well, I mean, I suppose it depends what's trending. It could be, you know, if you're looking for stuff uh, to sell at Christmas on January the 1st, that's obviously a bad move. Um, but, you know, I'll give you an example with Bitcoin. And there's a lot of people saying that, oh, it's too late and everyone's in it. But how many people out of 7 billion are in Bitcoin? There's still quite a few million Bitcoin still to be mined. Um, there's still, what, 3 billion people who don't have internet in the world. 
So I think it's important to get a balanced view of, um, you know, if a market is saturated, I think we have confirmation bias. So what we see everyone talking about, we think everyone's talking about. But remember, Facebook and Twitter and all of our news feeds, they're clever. And they know what we like to look for and they feed back to us what we look for. So what we see on our feed that we think everyone is talking about, it's not. It's just what the algorithms are putting back to us. Um, I think there's always room for the best. Uh, and so, you know, like I was an artist 11, 12 years ago. There were, there's loads of artists, um, but I wasn't the best artist and that's why I didn't succeed. I got into property, there's loads of people getting into property, but I did all right because, you know, I decided to focus on that and to stay in that for the long term. And of course, you know, there's, there, you, you could say there's lots of people doing everything, um, but yeah, I just think with the internet, with uh, the amount of people that are starting apps and the ability to set up your business online from your phone, from your device, I just think that being a startup is a, is a great, uh, exciting potential at the moment. The great thing as well is you can test really quickly. So, you know, let's say you wanted to be a macaroon decorator. Well, you could set up a macaroon decorating app and you could go into a few Facebook groups uh, and you could test if, uh, it's just a random example. It's a um, macaroon yeah, making app. There are, uh, yeah, well, there are a lot of, there, there, there um, on my podcast, The Disruptive Entrepreneur, I actually have someone who follows me who their career is they, they decorate macaroons while I'm using it as a random example. And, okay, that's a bit hyper niche. Um, but the point is you can, you can set up a, an app really quickly from a, a European uh, coder who will do it for you for probably less than a thousand quid. You can go find some Facebook groups and some social groups online and search and go into some groups where there are people who are interested in the same space as you. You can do polls and you can quickly test if there's any kind of response and if there's not then you, you know you can pivot and go and do something else very quickly without losing a lot of money and that's how I write my book so money is my 10th book um, and before maybe my first three books I'd write about what I'd want to write about but how do I know that the world wants to listen to me because I haven't asked uh, now I'll go into Facebook groups in property or money or business and I'll say hey what are you interested in what what challenges are you experiencing uh, and I'll crowdsource the demand and then I'll go and write books on where there's demand as long as I feel that I've got knowledge in it um, and you could just pivot much qu more, more quickly, you know. Imagine 50 years ago, you know, you had to set up the business that your father and your father's father and your father's 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 father passed down to you, you know, butchers and sons, uh, and you had to get huge overhead, didn't you, with premises and stock and everything else, and then hope that all the people in the village came into your shop. And now you've got access to billions of people on your phone, on any device, through social media. So I think it's exciting times, but it is disruptive times, and that does mean there might be more competition. So you have to be better, you have to be quicker. I wonder how much then of the barrier is in our heads. You have this line. A lack of wealth and money is simply a non-conversion of your unique wealth and genius into cash form. Others have monetized their genius, and so can you. Mm. So it suggests to me that you believe that everyone has this innate ability, but there's some kind of barrier. Yeah. To what extent do you think that is a mental one? Um, well, I think that our inner game, our mental game, is probably a larger percentage um, you know, like controlling our emotions, being self-aware of our emotions. I'll give you some examples. When it comes to money, if you're over elated, you will go and spend too much money. If you're overly depressed, you will go and spend too much money. So any volatile emotions uh, generally tend to erode wealth. So what I mean by that statement is I believe uh, we all have our own individual purpose, our own individual values and uniqueness. Now, what wealthy people have done is converted their skills and talents, snooker player, author, you know, entrepreneur, whatever. I mean, there's 15 million millionaires, um, in, so it's not like there's a lack of them. Um, they've converted what they do into monetary form. Everybody else just hasn't yet, whether it's still a hobby or they just haven't worked out how to solve a problem that the world needs. Uh, and there's all sorts of weird and wonderful things. You remember the slinky, you know, the thing that used to go down the stairs like that, sold tens, maybe hundreds of millions worth of products, just a slinky um, post-it note, just such a but simple a thing. I mean, it didn't solve a problem. It, well, it clear, you, there clearly could, was a demand you there. You crowdsource the need. So then how... Do you know, people are selling crypto kitties at the moment. They've got their own... You know, one of them sold for, I think, £150,000, your own unique kitty in, um, that you buy in cryptocurrency. 
So, you know, a need and a problem doesn't have to be, you know, a, a third world famine or disease. It can just be what people want to entertain themselves with. You know, Netflix solve a problem, don't they? It's only 5 99 a month, but millions and millions and millions of people are like to binge watch on Netflix. So, you know, the, the problem can be information. It can be, uh, you know, health and well-being. It can just be entertainment. Mm -hmm. Tell us a bit about your story, because... You've gone through this, this journey yourself. Yeah, so uh, my, my dad was an entrepreneur. You know, you could call him the hustler, as the Americans say. And he kind of went uh, wealthy, bust, wealthy, bust. He had a bit of an emotional uh, journey. He bought pubs and hotels. He had lots in Mildenhall and Lake and Heath. And then when the Gulf War happened, everyone just left. And so did all of his customers. Uh, and so he always, I always followed him around. I loved, you know, look, looked up to my dad, loved being around him. And so, you know, I always wanted to be like him, an entrepreneur. But then when I went to school and then university, I kind of lost my way. I didn't really know what I wanted to do with my life. And I got myself in a lot of debt through university and then trying to be an artist and trying to sell my art but not doing very well because I could paint but I couldn't sell because I was scared of the salesy part. So I just used to paint more to try and solve that problem. Uh, but I wasn't getting out to the galleries. I couldn't take the rejection from showing my art. Um, and then I got into property and I kind of stumbled into property because... A gallery owner who was hanging my art said, hey, you should go to this property event and you should just be open-minded to get into property. And this was 2005. So I did. Um, and uh, my dad helped me buy my first house. And then I met a JV partner, a business partner, who funded the next 20 for us. And then we recycled their, their deposits. And then we funded the next 30. And, then, and, and I went from one to about 720 properties that I own, manage. Um, uh, and then once we'd kind of built enough of a portfolio... Um, I thought, oh, okay, now I can start expressing my creativity in other ways, such as writing books and teaching other people to how to, to invest in property and set up businesses and through my podcasts and the various books that I've written. And um, I, I think I unleashed, if you like, my latent wealth that was always in me when I was an artist um, because I was actually really excited. You know, art, I just, as much as I liked art, I didn't want to do the commercial side of it. Um, but property is, is great because it solves a problem because it houses people and it seems to go up in value a lot. Mm -hmm. You are um, a keen advocate of, of finding good mentors and mm. surrounding yourself with the types of people who you aspire to be as well. And you also, as you say, have this podcast where you interview entrepreneurs. So I wonder, have you gleaned from that some sort of tricks, some tips that you could share with us of things that people who are already uh, successful do, mm. habits, tricks, how, the commonalities that you found uh, among people. Sure, okay. So um, a, a lot of people say, don't they, that it's good to learn from your mistakes. I say that could be pretty dumb. I mean, would you like to learn about going bust by going bust? Probably not. What about learning from the mistakes of other people who've been there and done it, you know, vicariously learning from their mistakes and not your own? Um, and that's the view I've taken for the last 11 years, and it's, and it's served me well. So I'm fortunate to be mentored by a lot of smart people, some billionaires, some people who are quite famous, some people who wouldn't want to be named. Uh, and then I became a mentor myself and passed that that information on so um, hey look we could sit here all day and talk about what I've gleaned so if I could just summarize a few points number one would be um, that the most successful people on the planet who've grown vast wealth understand that money is not all the emotions that we project upon it you know it, it's, it's greed it's um, you know it's a power it's debt it's pain Actually, money is a universal exchange of value that has no emotions. It's, it, it's completely amoral. It's simply a way that you and I exchange value between each other. You produce something with your heart, soul and passion. I'm interested in it. I want to, you know, have some of that heart, soul and passion in the form of a solution or a product. And I exchange the amount of paper money that I believe it's worth. And that paper money is storing my passion and enthusiasm that I put into it as a property investor or an author, and we're just passing that around the world. Um, and so therefore, if you want more money, you need to increase the value that you give to the world. Generally speaking, the people who are wealthy produce, whether it's post-it notes or serving the third world and getting rid of debt or um, you know, computers or iPhones, vast production creates vast wealth. Uh, and, and 
consumers tend to be the ones who remained relatively poor, i.e. they don't produce but they consume. Um, so understand what money really is, which is why I wrote this book. Um, if you want to increase your wealth, you need to increase the value first. I hire maybe, what, I've got about 75 staff in the office, about 150 out of the office. And the amount of times people have sat in front of me and said, hey, Rob, I want a pay rise because I've got to pay my car loan and my mortgage is a bit high and all that. They don't understand that they're not producing value by asking me for a pay rise. They're saying that well, they want to consume more from me. Um, but if they came to me with a little spreadsheet and said, hey, Rob, in the last year I've made this much money for you in the career, I propose a pay rise of 20% of the 100% increase in value and revenue I'm going to generate for the business what do you think? Now, I'm going to shake my hands on that because they're showing me how they can create value. So, and it's easier than ever because you just go into communities, Facebook groups, tw you know, follow influencers on Twitter, and you ask people what it is that they want and need, and you give it to them. Okay. So it's understanding what money is yeah. and producing. Yeah, and creating value. And one I particularly enjoyed that you mentioned as well is, is when you read these articles of, of what highly successful people have in common, they all get up at half five in the morning. You say that's not necessarily essential. Though it's, it's hard to tell really the cause and effect there, mm. whether, whether um, you can make yourself successful by getting up at half five in the morning or, or successful people are inherently early birds. Mm. But anyway, either way, you say not necessarily necessary. No, exactly. And now, when I first started studying entrepreneurs, you know, all the famous entrepreneurs at the time, and they're quite polarizing people like Maggie Thatcher and Donald Trump and all this lot, they're up at like 4 a.m. and they seem to sleep four hours a day. So, for my first couple of years hustling as an entrepreneur, I was trying to get up earlier and earlier and earlier and earlier and earlier because I thought that's what you had to do, and you end up burning yourself out. So actually, it's not about being in the 4 a.m. club or the 3 a.m. club and posting it on Facebook. It's more about what times of the day are you the most productive. Now, the majority of the world, they get up at 7, 7.30, and they go to work, and they go to bed 10, 30, 11 at night, or whatever. Entrepreneurs tend to get up earlier um, because they're working for themselves, and they can see the direct uh, uh, out input from their output but actually I think we all have different seasons in our day and in our body I, I actually get up at about five in the morning but I have to go to bed at about eight thirty nine to maintain that over a period of time so I think that you shouldn't think that you have to get up earlier and earlier and earlier I, the book I wrote before money is called life leverage uh, and, and and I talked about how to be smarter with your time how to leverage because, you know, I was brought up by a hard-working northern man, and basically the only way he and most of, you know, the generation above me, my parents and their parents, the only way they knew how to be successful is hard graft. Hard, hard graft. But with apps and technology and the internet and social media now, it's actually you want to work smarter, not harder. You know, anyone can have a, a VA, you know, an online PA. You can earn 20 grand a year and have your own... P PA that's online that you know manages all your social media and um, one of my friends who works up really high in Santander he uh, invests a lot into funding circle a lot and he got um, a European coder to write him this sort of like very advanced deal analyzer to analyze all these deals and it cost him less than a thousand pounds to automate his investing into uh, crowdfunding and he was consistently making 12% when everyone else was making 6% just some random coder that so it's like you've got to work smart as well as hard because we can all work hard for a year or five years we were talking about people commuting weren't we before we started can you work hard for 30 years what about if you've got kids you know what about if you want balance in your life and i think you know this just hustle and hard graft it's only one side of the equation i've got young kids i want to spend a lot of time with them and so i think maintaining some balance and performing some leverage uh, you know, getting other, Richard Branson has five PAs, so he's not just at working hard. Um, I think that's important too. Okay. I want to ask you finally, you mentioned a moment ago learning from other people's mistakes and the value of that. Mm. I wonder if there's one mistake that you've made that other people could learn from. What there, might that be? There's many mistakes that I've made, uh, and I think that the upside of the mistakes I make is that I try things. Um, I did crash my Ferrari into the News International building. Uh, it was in the sun, so that was probably a mistake I would say don't make. I'd had it for five days. Uh, um, I think in property and in podcasting uh, and maybe in Bitcoin uh, and maybe in general business, I think there were, the opportunity was there for me maybe between one and three years before I got in. So um, I think 
maybe I was a bit slow to see an opportunity. And I think that was because I was worried about this, the failure. I was worried about what other people would say. I was worried about if it didn't work and I might publicly look stupid for, you know, losing money or not making it work in business. Uh, and so what other people think about you and your perceived public failure, I think, is probably the biggest thing that will hold you back. Mm -hmm. And one of my good friends is Gerald Ratner, and of course, you know, he had a real public humiliation and he, it left him seven years in the wilderness. Um, he's someone I interview on my podcast. Uh, but actually, um, he used that as motivation and he came back uh, and his online jewellery business is now worth £35 million and he's, he's got 70 keynote speeches between a couple of weeks ago and Christmas. So he's literally packed out with the speeches, dining off his <laughs> failure way back in, in the 90s. Uh, and I think he would be less concerned now about what other people thought about him and he would just go and do what is right for him and right for his customers you know, and right for the, the people that he cares about. Because you, know, you only have one life uh, and there's, there's a passion, there's a message inside of you. There's a book inside everyone, it's just they haven't got it out yet. Um, and so I would say, just get it out there. Just go and do it. Yeah, because also version two can be better than one, three can be better than two, four can be better than three. Mm -hmm. So one of my property books is the fifth edition. The first edition, if I'm quite frankly looking back at it, wasn't very good. Um, but the fifth edition is better. The sixth edition would be, be it would be better again. Mm -hmm. So you can always try this thing, and if it's not the best, you can just improve it over time. Okay, so that seems to be the key message. Just get started. Mm. Fix it later if yeah. you need to. Yeah, Don't yeah. worry about people. what people mm. think necessarily. Yeah, well, they, they have words for it in tech. Iteration, mm -hmm. yeah, just um, pivots. There's all these fancy tech words for it. Yeah. Get, your, get your thing out there. Try it. Scale it up as it gets better. Thank you so much for talking us through that and your tips. And thank you for joining us for the big money questions. Thank you, Rachel.